Dear people of God, you are welcome to another episode of Women of Excellence. How has it been with you and your household? I believe the Lord is still very good unto you. He's ever good. I pray we uphold you till the end in Jesus' name. Shall we pray? Our God and our Father, eternal rock of ages, we bless your holy name. We thank you for today. We thank you for another opportunity to gather together to learn at your feet. Father, King of glory, as we go into your word, we know your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Father, King of glory, I pray that you will illuminate every area of our life that is in obscurity in the name of Jesus. Father, King of glory, as we go into your word, Father, I pray that you speak to us in accent, simple and clear. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Today we'll be talking about relationship violence. Violence in relationship, which is a common thing now. Recently, we read in the pages of the newspaper of a woman, a young lady that killed her husband and was recently sentenced to six years of imprisonment. The other time it was about a man that slaughtered the wife like a goat. In our neighborhood, in the streets, in the places of work, these are common discussions and scenarios. The church is not even exempted and violence in relationship is not far-fetched. We have seen a man of God that kicked pregnancy out of the wife's womb as a result of fighting. Can you imagine that? That is the highest level of violence. On a regular basis, we settle or intervene in quarrels that are life-threatening. Quarrels that maim, quarrels that send one of the couple to the hospital. A woman recently lost one of her eyes as a result of injury sustained from constant beating and slapping from the husband. What about a husband that wanted to use the wife for money rituals and all sorts of messy situations? What about a wife that starves her husband of all starvables, if there is any English word like that? May God deliver us from the wile of the devil in the name of Jesus. I'm sure no parent wishes to lose a child after nurturing him or her to maturity. When you think of the stress of training him or her through school, the pain of job search and eventually securing a good job, and now planning to settle down to a good life, and then suddenly the devil strikes. All of a sudden, a lady or a guy or a man appears from the blues, from nowhere, in the name of marriage, and takes his or her life as a result of violence in the relationship. Who is the loser then, I may ask? If I may ask, is it you as a parent or the spouse? God forbids you will not lose your child untimely in the name of Jesus. So we need to be careful. As you train a girl child to be a good wife, you must not neglect the boy child who is going to marry her. He too must be trained to be a good husband. Many ladies are afraid of going into marriage today because of what their mothers went through in the hands of their fathers. Likewise, the young men of these days 
of marriageable age are scared of picking up wives because of their own household experiences, how their mothers treated their fathers. It is a case of coin of two sides. Parents are afraid of letting go of their children to start their lives, as the Bible rightly instructed in Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. He says, therefore, shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. Why? Because of your violence, parents are afraid of letting go of their children. So the topic we'll be considering in the next two weeks is violence in marriage. <music> violence in marriage. I went to deliver this talk at a youth program somewhere. And the questions that ensued were revealing. You will be surprised to find out that some of our youths who are already into serious relationships and getting ready for marriage are already experiencing violence, even during courtship. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine that? So the question is, what will now happen after the marriage has been contracted? After the nuptial knot had been tied, parents, we need to be smart. You need to be prayerful. And we need to take some bold steps. Bible says we should walk and pray. James chapter 2 verse 20. As you pray, you have to walk. Walk on these children. As we pray, fast and believe God for a bright and peaceful future for our children, we should also open our eyes wide. Like the youths, we always say, shine your eyes. Shine your eyes as parents. Yes, I believe in the will of God so much. But the question is, how many of the young ones among this generation know how to seek the face of God? Talk less of asking God for direction. Talk less of them following the will of God. We need to go back to the basis. People of God, the church is so busy doing some other things and neglecting the primary assignment of soul winning. We need to catch them young and instill the fear of God in them. We need to teach them the value and sanctity of marriage. We need to let them know the importance of life and have value for life. We need to open their eyes to the plans of God for their lives, marriage inclusive. Most of the time when we talk about the plan of God for our lives, we talk about good education. That is going to the best and most expensive schools in the country, training your children abroad, providing everything they need, and the likes. When we talk of the plan of God, most of the time, we talk about good jobs, getting employed in oil companies, multinational companies, companies with good and juicy take-home packages, with an official car, official apartment, and the likes. Life is beyond this. When we talk about the plan of God for our lives, most of the time, what the youth talk about is good businesses, businesses that will earn you contracts worth millions of dollars, which will become billions of naira after conversion, and the likes. When the youths are talking about plan of God for their lives, most of the time they talk about financial prosperity, financial freedom, breakthroughs, and the likes. All these are good. I'm not against all these. They are good, and that is what God wants us to enjoy. And when we talk of the plan of God for our lives, most of the time we forget to talk about our marriages, our homes, and our life partners. Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11 is a very popular passage. We all quote it offhand. The Bible says, For I know the thoughts that I have towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and of, not of evil to give you an expected end. 
I want you to take note of the word thoughts. It is in plural form, which implies God has so many plans for us as his children. God is interested in all areas of our lives that you can think of. Most of the time, we try to manipulate the plans of God to suit our selfish interests. We will expatiate on this in the course of this series. I pray the Lord will open our eyes of understanding. I said we should be mindful of the word thoughts in that passage we quoted. It is in plural form. Why the result is the expected end, which is singular. That means one glorious end, one beautiful and peaceful end, one enviable end. What a good God we serve. I think we should clap for our Lord Jesus Christ because he has beautiful plans for us. The expected end, the utmost end here is to make heaven at the end of our sojourn here on earth. The Bible says, for what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Mark chapter 8, verse 36. Now, if there is violence in your home, I mean in your marriage, will you not nurse grudges? Will you not nurse hatred? Will you not nurse bitterness? Will you not nurse revenge and retaliation? then how will you get to the expected end that God designed for you? You now see why we should take this issue so seriously. God will help us. The topic we are considering is a very, very important one, especially this time that a lot of things are happening in the households and in the nation and society at large. The life you are to live as a wife begins today as a spinster, as a young girl. An adage says the money shows the day. The Bible even says better is the end of a thing than the beginning thereof. Ecclesiastes chapter 7 verse 8. The foundation of a happy and fulfilled life starts today. Psalm 11 verse 3 says if the foundation be destroyed, what can the righteous do? As a married man or woman, have you ever asked yourself how you find yourself in that perplexing situation? When we talk about relationships in this context, it is an emotional connection between two people, a romantic and sexual relationship between a man and a woman, not a romantic or sexual relationship between two women lesbianism, not between two men, which is homosexuality, not between man, woman, and animal, that is bestiality, that is not God's plan. But we are referring to a romantic relationship between a man and a woman, a guy and a lady who are lovebirds, intending to get married or are already married. Not the word lovebirds, you are always all over yourselves. You cannot do without each other. Always wanted to be together, eat together, go out together, sleep together, and do a lot of things together. You are lovebirds. A relationship established by God himself. In Genesis chapter 2 verse 18. Bible says it is not good. God said it is not good that a man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. Another version says help beats for him. Remember God himself at the dawn of marriage became the father of the bride and presented the woman to the man in Genesis chapter 2 verses 21 to 23. And we special as ladies, thank God for your life. Man, you need to thank God for the woman in your life. She's a gift, not just any gift, but a precious one at that and must be cherished. When you marry a child of God, God becomes your father-in-law. If you marry a child of the devil, the devil becomes your father-in-law. So you must choose the preferred one. 
If you choose a child of God, then the relationship must be established on the solid rock, Jesus. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14 says, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship as righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion as light with darkness? Genesis chapter 2, verses 24 and 25 says, A man shall leave his father and his mother, and cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one. That is the type of relationship we are talking about here. Jesus is now at the center of the relationship. So why do you now hit or beat your spouse? Why the violence? You should not allow the devil to infiltrate that home. It will only come to steal, to kill, and to destroy. I pray the Lord will uphold your family in Jesus' name. Don't give him a chance. What is violence? As defined by WHO, it is an intentional use of physical force or power, threatened or actual, against an individual group or community, which either results in or likelihood to result in injury, hurt, or psychological trauma. As children of God, we must not be involved no matter the level of provocation. As women, we can be naughty at times. Even men can sometimes be annoying, but we must learn to tolerate ourselves. Remember, you are both coming from different backgrounds, so you cannot be the same. You cannot act the same way, and you cannot do things the same way. But for you to strike a balance and find a midpoint in your behavior, you must be tolerant with each other. The Lord will help us in the name of Jesus. What is God's plan for marital relationship? What is God's plan for marital relationship? Number one, husband and wife to be stronger spiritually. When you are married, God intends you to be stronger spiritually. Number two, husband and wife must be able to serve the Lord more effectively together. You help each other to be more committed to the things of God. Number three, effectiveness to be multiplied. When you come together, you are more effective in your delivery. Number four, you share burdens. You share your body, you pray together, you talk together, you look for solutions on issues together. Number five, you meet physical needs. Number six, you meet emotional needs. And number seven, you glorify God. You worship him and do his work together. Mind you, no parents were there at creation. When God created you, no parents was there except God. So whatever you may be going through, take it to the Lord in prayers. Though you need counsel, the Bible says, where there is no counsel, the people perish. Where no advice is, the people fall. But in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. Proverbs 11 verse 14. Why do people fight in relationship? Why hit yourself? The simple answer that comes to mind is, if I may ask you, the devil. is the devil. We put the blame on the devil every time. Number one, the devil is the inventor of evil. There is nothing evil in God. So if things are bad, look around. The devil is not far-fetched. He's certainly around the corner. He brought confusion into Job's life as he goes to and fro. Though with God's permission, for God to prove a point. So the devil is always the inventor of evil. Number two, misunderstanding. There should not be a case of preponderant arguments. Everyone is entitled to his or her own opinion. In marriage, we should relate with each other with understanding. First Peter chapter 3, verse 7 says, Husbands, 
Likewise, dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife. Yes, I agree that misunderstanding can ensue, but one must pipe low for the other. Two wrongs don't make a right. Don't allow misunderstanding to disintegrate your home. It can infuriate anger. So be watchful. Be watchful. Number three, why fighting? Unresolved arguments. Do not go to bed each day without settling any argument that arose during the day. This can lead to throwing tantrums the following day and can degenerate into serious fights. Mind you, the devil always looks for an occasion to strike in homes. Do not give him a chance. One of the reasons why you must resolve an argument before going to bed is that it provides an opportunity for you to give your partner honest feedback because you are feeling a variety of emotion. Because of what you are feeling, you give him feedback. As with all human behaviors, the brain forgets things. Most couples who intend to follow up on something the following day rarely do. You forget. Number two, addressing an argument before you go to bed provides the foundation for a better night's sleep. You will have good sleep. If you go to bed cranky and irritable, chances are that you will wake up in the morning unrefreshed. You will not be happy. And thirdly, if Christ should come, which is the most important thing, in the middle of the night, you aren't going anywhere. Be careful. Don't give the devil an occasion to fulfill his desire in your life. Then number four, lack of communication. It's another thing that causes violence in marriage. We will dwell on this in the next episode. Make sure you don't miss it. I pray the Lord will help us in Jesus' name. Don't assume he or she should know. Communicate. Open your mouth. Tell him or her how you feel. In my own marriage and my home, I talk too much. With no room for assumptions. Explain all explainables and describe all describable. It's different from nagging. We shall discuss this fully next time. Then number five, another reason why people fight, why there is violence in home is mistrust. 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 The Lord will help us in Jesus' name. You must not bottle up anything. You must exercise caution. You must trust your husband. If there is anything that needs clarification, ask him. Don't just assume your assumption most of the time is wrong. The number six, tension. The stress in this world can build up tensions at home. So you must not transfer aggression to your spouse. You must always clear your brain. You must relax, breathe in and breathe out. And you will have your peace. Listen to good music. Behold nature to appreciate God. Go to the serene environment, a godly environment to relax and take in godly stuff. And the peace of God which passes all understanding shall rest upon you. The list is not exhaustive yet. Notwithstanding, let's stop here for now. We will continue next time. Congratulations. Because God is in the process of making you an excellent woman, and a signature for all eyes that future generations shall talk about as we talk about virtuous women in the Bible like Deborah, who said, and I arose a mother in Israel. What about Esther, who said, if I perish, I perish, in the quest of saving a generation, and she did not perish. She exhibited a rugged faith and became adjudged as a virtuous woman. Or should we talk about Abigail, who saved a household from looming destruction occasioned by her husband's behavior? Or Mary, who preserved herself in a perverse generation and became the mother of Jesus, our Lord? It is your turn to be talked about. And I pray that God will restore unto us the virtues designed for us 
to be a blueprint for our generation as women of God. God bless you in the name of Jesus. Shall we pray? Our God and our Father, eternal rock of ages, we bless your holy name for this, your word that has gone forth again today. Father, King of glory, I pray as many homes that are hurting right now, I pray that you speak your peace in the name of Jesus. As many homes that are passing through one stormy situation or the other, I pray that you will calm the storm in the name of Jesus. You are the master over the storm. Father, speak your word into such home in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Heavenly Father. In Jesus' precious name, we have prayed. Amen. We are women.